So on the agenda today, uh, we'll talk about our spectrum analyzer basic measurements. We'll talk about what is a spectrum analyzer. I'll go over some key terms and analyzer basics and what measurements are used. So what is a spectrum analyzer? It is a receiver that displays the received signals on its screen as amplitude or power versus frequency. It provides an effective insight into RF performance of a system. It analyzes radio frequency spectrum, measures intended and interfering signals, allows the setup of parameters such as frequency, amplitude, and allows you to set up markers to help identify what you are seeing. It graphically displays a signal amplitude versus frequency, and it will also allow you to save your traces. It can be a portable or standalone bench equipment. Why use a spectrum analyzer? And before we continue on, we're gonna open up the lines to take a brief poll. Uh, so Donna, could you open up the poll questions, please? Sure, thanks Greg. Um, so on your screen, you guys will see the poll. Um, please go ahead and select um, all the answers that apply. And the question, what application do you use your spectrum analyzer for? And if you're having issues um, selecting your answer, you may want to uh, minimize your screen out of full uh, screen mode to be able to answer the poll. So we'll go ahead and give you a few minutes to answer. Thanks. And while that poll is open, I'll just continue on. So, you know, what can a spectrum analyzer do that no other piece of a test equipment can do? Well, they offer the ability to look at either a wide range of frequencies in order to find interfering signals, a narrow range to look out of band or in-band noise or interference. It allows you to check transmitters for harmonics, uh, look for intermodulation products, find that rogue station that keeps coming up and stepping on my signal, all in a user-definable handheld package. And these are the types of measurements the things that uh, we use a spectrum analyzer to look for. Some of the key terms we're gonna talk about, um, you know, a spectrum analyzer, they look at the frequency spectrum signal to identify the following signals. You know, it helps you find noise and we define noise as any unwanted signal. We can look at harmonics. We can look at RFI, radio frequency interference, and these things come from things such as thermal noise, shot noise, transistor noise, and atmospheric noise. Intermodulation, which that's a signal that results from the mixing of two or more RF signals. And then finally, we can look at the noise floor. So uh, what people look are looking for. So one of the definitions I have is harmonics. And as I mentioned, harmonics are unwanted signals. They interfere with communications. They are produced in a non-linear amplifier, component, et cetera. And they appear on in whole number multiples of frequency. Harmonics are not always unwanted, however, because sometimes we want to make a frequency doubler, tripler, and so on. As I mentioned, harmonics are whole number multiples of a frequency. The first harmonic is the frequency, also known as the fundamental. So for instance, uh, the first harmonic of 800 megahertz is 800 megahertz. The second harmonic is the double the original frequency or two times 800 megahertz is 1600 megahertz or 1.6 gigahertz. The third harmonic is three times the original frequency. Three times 800 is 2400 megahertz, and you just continue on down the line. Harmonics typically do not cause system degradation in the system, causing or creating the harmonic content 
but will cause problems for other systems using the frequencies or channels the harmonics fall on. Noise floor is the measure of the signal created from the sum of all the noise sources and unwanted signals within a measurement system, where noise is defined as any signal other than the one being monitored, including thermal noise, and these are this is the noise produced from component heating, cosmic noise, this originates outside the Earth's atmosphere, similar to thermal noise, and atmospheric noise. It's primarily from lightning discharge in thunderstorms. Noise floor is the lowest signal power level that can be measured when using a spectrum analyzer or other device. And one thing you will find that when you're in a big cities versus whether you're out in the rural or farm areas, the noise floor is much higher in the big cities. And this is all because, you know, there's all kinds of electronics, fluorescent lighting, there's just all kinds of things going on in the big cities that produce all this different noise, which raises the noise floor. The noise floor defines the point at which a signal used in communication is no longer usable. RBW, or resolution bandwidth, is the bandpass filter in the IF path of the analyzer. It determines the RF noise floor and how close two signals can be and still be resolved by the analyzer into two separate peaks. Adjusting the bandwidth of this filter allows for the discrimination of signals with closely spaced frequency components while also changing the measured noise floor. Decreasing the bandwidth of, of an RBW filter decreases the measured noise floor and vice versa. VBW, or video bandwidth, determines the capability to discriminate between two different power levels. This is because a narrower video bandwidth will remove noise in the detector output. Video bandwidth is used to smooth the display by removing noise from the envelope, which is considered helpful when assessing low level signals. The lower the VBW, the slower the sweep speed. The higher the video bandwidth, the faster the sweep speed. DANL. This is displayed average noise level, and this is the minimum level that the spectrum analyzer can measure and reflects the internal noise level of the spectrum analyzer. DANL determines the sensitivity of the spectrum analyzer. And to increase the sensitivity of the spectrum analyzer, adding a preamp with a lower noise figure and attenuators to reduce the noise figure of the spectrum analyzer. Lower resolution bandwidth leads to lower DANL. And then we have SINED, which is the signal to noise and distortion ratio. It's a measure of the quality of a signal from a communications device. SINAD is equal to the power in the signal plus the power in the noise plus the power in the distortion divided by the power in the noise plus the power in the distortion. Where P is the average power of the signal, noise and distortion components. It's expressed in dB. It's quoted alongside receiver sensitivity, and it is never less than one. For example, a receiver sensitivity has 0.25 microvolts at 12 dB SINAD. This means the receiver will produce intelligible speech with an input signal as low as 25 microvolts. There are several ways that we can connect a spectrum analyzer and look at a signal. One of the ways is we can pull a signal over the air by use of an antenna. Or we can have a direct connection to a transmitter. You have to realize though that the spectrum analyzer is gonna have a maximum input. And in our case of the SH-60STC, the max input is plus 20 dBm 
or 100 milliwatts. You may need an attenuator, a coupler, or a sample sampler when uh, connecting to a transmitter or a radio. So an over-the-air connection is looking like this, where your transmitter is putting out a signal, goes up to the antenna, and once it reaches the antenna, then it leaves there and goes to the antenna on the input to the test port of the spectrum analyzer. Direct connection, you know, if your signal is above plus 20 dBm out of the transmitter, well, then you want to put an attenuator on it to limit how much power is going into the analyzer. And then finally, you can connect directly to an antenna and also direct connect to the spectrum analyzer through the use of a sampler or a coupler. And the signal goes out to the antenna and then you get the coupled signal to come off into the spectrum analyzer. We'll talk about a little bit about the theory. What is spectrum analysis? It allows us to look at individual signals. It takes apart a complex sine wave or multiple signals, looks at amplitude versus frequency, allows us to look at a range of frequencies. It'll cover a wide range of frequency and then narrow into our problem area. And it allows us to check our own equipment such as a transmitter, base station, repeater, or other output. Should I use an oscilloscope or a spectrum analyzer? Well, an oscilloscope displays a signal with respect to time, and a spectrum analyzer shows it with respect to frequency. So here, um, and, and we may be able to show several different parameters on a piece of test equipment, but for the spectrum analyzer, the display will show the amplitude or power contained in the signal versus the frequency that the power is being transmitted or broadcast on. The waveform or wave shape is not displayed as that would be a plot of amplitude versus time or the changing voltage current or power level versus time. We can only display two characteristics on a two-dimensional graph and the spectrum analyzer shows amplitude either the power or voltage level versus frequency. Don't expect to see a wave shape on the screen of any spec GAN. This screenshot um, of the signal hawk will act as our introduction to the unit itself. The screen, is display the screen displayed is the frequency or span display, which allows the user to set up the unit to display a certain frequency range from a specific start frequency to a specific stop frequency. The unit can be set up using several approaches, using the start and stop, center and span, um, or by selecting from a list of predefined measurements specific to certain applications. So here we have the frequency on the x-axis, start on the left, stop on the right, and it's on the horizontal scale. Then on the uh, vertical scale, we have the amplitude, or on the y-axis. And as I mentioned, you don't see a waveform like you would on an oscilloscope. The waveform or shape is seen on an oscilloscope. The oscilloscope plots the voltage versus time. So let's go to a 10,000 foot view of the spectrum analyzer. Traditionally, when you wanna look at an electrical signal, you use an oscilloscope to see how the signal varies with time. This is very important information. However, it doesn't give you the full picture. To fully understand the performance of your device or system, you will also want to analyze the signal in the frequency domain. This is a graphical representation of the signal's amplitude as a function of frequency. The spectrum analyzer is to the frequency domain as the oscilloscope is to the time domain. It is important to note that spectrum analyzers can also be used in the fixed tune mode or zero span to provide time domain measurement capability, much like that of an oscilloscope. 
The figure shows a signal in both the time and the frequency domains. In the time domain, all frequency components of the signal are summed together and displayed. In the frequency domain, complex signals, um, that is signals composed of more than one frequency, are separated into their frequency components and the level at each frequency is displayed. Frequency domain measurements have several distinct advantage. For example, let's say you're looking at a signal on an oscilloscope that appears to be a pure sine wave. A pure sine wave has no harmonic distortion. If you look at the signal on a spectrum analyzer, you may find that your signal is actually made up of several frequencies. What was not discernible on the oscilloscope becomes very apparent on the spectrum analyzer. Some systems are inherently frequency domain oriented. For example, many telecommunication systems use what is called FDMA or frequency division multiple access or FDM, frequency division multiplexing. In these systems, different users are assigned different frequencies for transmitting and receiving, such as with a cellular telephone. Radio stations also use FDM with each station in a given geographical area occupying a particular frequency band. These types of systems must be analyzed in the frequency domain in order to make sure that no one is interfering with users or radio stations on neighboring frequencies. Measuring with a frequency domain analyzer can greatly reduce the amount of noise present in the measurement because of its ability to narrow the measurement bandwidth. From this view of the spectrum, measurements of frequency, power, harmonic content, modulation, spurs, and noise can easily be made. Given the capability to measure these quantities, we can determine total harmonic distortion, occupied bandwidth, signal stability, output power, intermod distortion, power bandwidth, carrier to noise ratio, and a host of other measurements using just a spectrum analyzer. Some of the most common spectrum analyzer measurements are modulation, distortion, and noise. If a modulated signal is distorted or carries sidebands, it may not be accurately demodulated in a receiver. Signal power is always important as it will not only determine how far a signal will be transmitted, but will also confirm that the signal stays within the area it is licensed to. Power occurring in the sidebands may not be where it is needed. Modulation degree and occupied bandwidth are common modulation measurements that can be taken using a spectrum generator. Signal distortion is always important in communication systems and components. Harmonic content added to the primary signal will result in interference with other communication systems. Harmonics may also contribute to intermodulation distortion, again resulting in interference or in loss of signal on a system's primary channel. Intermodulation, harmonics, and spurious emissions are all types of distortion that may be generated within a system or outside of a system. A third common measurement is noise, which we have defined as any signal that is not our own and results in degrading a communication system or signal. Again, noise may be generated in any active circuit or device as well as outside if system com as well as outside of system components. Noise figure and signal, signal to noise ratio or SNR, they are measurements commonly used in comparing systems and signals. Understanding the basic operation of the spectrum analyzer is always the first step in conducting these and other test measurements. Understanding what a clean signal looks like is important as is being able to identify the degradation of signals. So here we have a mixer. It translates input signal up and down in frequency so it is easier to analyze. A mixer is a three port device converts a signal from one frequency to another, and this is sometimes called a frequency translation device. The input signal is applied to one input port, and then the local oscillator signal to the other. 
The output frequencies that will be produced by the mixer are the original input signals plus the sum and difference frequencies of these two signals. In reality, there are multiples of the sum and differences generating a picket fence of signals, but for our use, we're just going to pay attention to the fundamental sum and difference frequencies. The most common type of spectrum analyzer is the swept tuned receiver. Basically, these analyzers sweep across the frequency range of interest, displaying all the frequency components present, moving the window across the frequency range being analyzed. The swept receiver technique enables frequency domain measurements to be made over a large dynamic range and a wide frequency range. As the local oscillator is changed in frequency, the input signal does not change, but the mixing of the two signals changes at the output of the mixer. By controlling the sweep and the frequency of the local oscillator, meaningful data can be obtained. The data needs to down convert the signal to make it manageable. To make filters more manageable, the down conversion is done in stages with the final stage in the analog to digital converter, the ADC. And finally, the output is demodulated and scaled to the X and Y axis of the display, amplitude versus frequency. Of course, the first and foremost specification you want to know is the frequency range of the analyzer. This is controlled by the filter on the front end and the ability of the local oscillator to accurately tune over a wide enough range. And before you ask, I'll just tell you, the Bird SignalHawk SH60S will cover a frequency range from 9 kilohertz up to 6 gigahertz. Selectivity is an important characteristic for determining the resolvability of unequal amplitude signals. Selectivity is the ratio of the 60 dB to 3 dB filter bandwidth. Typical selectivities range from 11 to 1 to 15 to 1 for analog filters and 5 to 1 for digital filters. Usually we will be looking at signals of unequal amplitudes. Since both signals will trace out the filter shape, it is possible for the smaller signal to be buried under the filter skirt of the larger one. The greater the amplitude difference, the more a lower signal gets buried under the skirt of its neighbor's response. This is significant because most close-in signals you deal with are distortion or modulation products and, by nature, are quite different in amplitude from the parent signal. When measuring two signals of equal amplitude, the value of the selected resolution bandwidth tells us how close together they can be and still be distinguishable from one another by a 3 dB dip. Also determines how sharp of a skirt or roll off you can measure. For example, if two signals are 10 kilohertz apart, a 10 kilohertz resolution bandwidth will easily separate the responses. A wider resolution bandwidth may make the two signals appear as one. When we narrow the resolution bandwidth for better resolution, it takes longer to sweep because filters require a finite time to respond fully. When the sweep time is too short, the resolution bandwidth filters cannot fully respond and the displayed response becomes uncalibrated in both amplitude and frequency. The amplitude is too low, frequency is too high, shifts upwards due to delay through the filter. Spectrum analyzers have auto-coupled sweep time which automatically choose the fastest allowable sweep time based upon selected span, resolution bandwidth, and video bandwidth. When selecting the RBW, there is usually a 1 to 10 or a 1 to 3 to 10 sequence of RBWs 
available. Some spectrum analyzers even have 10% steps. A greater resolution bandwidth is better because this allows choosing just enough resolution to make the measurement at the fastest possible sweep time. For example, if a one kilohertz resolution or one second sweep time is not enough resolution, a 1310 sequence analyzer can make the measurement in a 300 hertz resolution bandwidth or a 10 second sweep time. Whereas the one to 10 sequence analyzer must use a 100 hertz resolution bandwidth, which is on 100 second sweep time. The remaining instability appears as noise sidebands, also called phase noise, at the base of the signal response. This noise can mask close in to a carrier low-level signals that we might otherwise be able to see if we were only to consider bandwidth and selectivity. These noise sidebands affect resolution of close-in, low-level signals. Phase noise is specified in terms of dBc or decibels relative to a carrier and is displayed only when the signal is far enough above the system noise floor. This becomes the ultimate limitation in an analyzer's ability to resolve signals of unequal amplitude. The above figure shows us that although we may have determined that we should be able to resolve two signals based on the 3 dB bandwidth and selectivity, we find that the phase noise actually covers up the smaller signal. Noise sideband specifications are typically normalized to a 1 hertz resolution bandwidth. Therefore, if we need to measure a, 50, a signal 50 dB down from a carrier at a 10 kilohertz offset in a 1 kilohertz resolution bandwidth, we need a phase noise spec of neg 80 dBc per hertz resolution bandwidth at 10 kilohertz offset. Note that 50 dBc in a 1 kilohertz resolution bandwidth can be normalized to a 1 hertz bandwidth using the following equation, neg 50 dBc minus uh, 10 times the log of the 1 kilohertz divided by 1 hertz, and that's eventually going to equal out to be minus 80 dBc. To accurately measure the relative amplitude of a signal's various characteristics, we have to understand and adjust for the impact of the resolution bandwidth on the apparent amplitude of the signal. If a very narrow resolution bandwidth is used to evaluate a signal that has a large bandwidth, there will be a difference between the total power of the signal, as indicated on a watt meter for example, in a peak amplitude displayed by the analyzer. The power indicated by a watt meter is the total power contained in the signal across its entire bandwidth. The amplitude displayed by the analyzer at each point on the waveform is the power contained only within the analyzer's IF filter response. To obtain the total power of the signal, the energy across the entire bandwidth of the signal uh, would have to be integrated together. When a resolution bandwidth is increased to a value equal to or greater than the total bandwidth of the signal, the peak amplitude displayed on the analyzer will equal the actual signal power level. For example, a signal with a total power of one milliwatt would display a zero dBm. As the resolution bandwidth is narrowed, the amount of power within the filter response becomes a fraction of the total power. The relationship between the peak signal displayed in a narrow resolution bandwidth and the total power of the signal can be expressed by the equation 10 times the log of the total bandwidth divided by the resolution bandwidth. In the case of an analog FM signal, over 99% of the energy is within a 25 kilohertz plus or minus 12 and a half kilohertz bandwidth. Applying the above formula, we see that the maximum power within the resolution bandwidth will be no greater than 23.2 dB below the total transmitted power. 
it is important that the peak signal level be set to the proper reference based upon the resolution bandwidth so that the relative amplitudes of the sideband and distortion products are correct. When measuring signals for compliance with FCC emission masks, it is critically important to use the correct resolution bandwidth. FCC masks are generally taken with a 300 Hz resolution bandwidth. Changing to a 100 Hz resolution bandwidth will make sideband noise and spurious signals appear 4.7 dB better. In our example, spectrum displays, to obtain accurate representations of the energy spectrum, the resolution bandwidth is very small on the order of 120 hertz. The spectrum is essentially divided up into small slices called bins. The size of each bin is equal to the resolution bandwidth of a 120 hertz. The power in each bin is measured and recorded. The spectrum display was then created by plotting the power level in each bin. The total transmitted power for each waveform would be the summation of the power in all of the bins. This is why the waveforms begin well below the 0 dB reference. All the waveforms are normalized to either 1 watt or 1 milliwatt total transmitted power, and the power in each bin is plotted with respect to that value. A spectrum analyzer generates and amplifies noise, just like any other active circuit. The signal to noise ratio decreases as RF input attenuation is increased. And one aspect of the an analyzer's internal noise that is often overlooked is its effective level as a function of the RF input attenuator setting. Since the internal noise is generated after the mixer, the RF attenuator has no effect on the actual noise level. However, the RF input attenuator does affect the signal level at the input and therefore decreases the signal to noise ratio of the analyzer. The best signal to noise ratio is with the lowest possible RF input attenuation. Note that in the figure, the displayed signal does not fall with increased attenuation. Remember from the theory of operations section that the RF input attenuator and IF gain are tied together. Therefore, as we increase the RF input attenuation uh, 10 dB, the IF gain will simultaneously increase 10 dB to compensate for the loss. The result is that the on-screen signal stays constant, but the amplified noise level increases 10 dB. And the final factor in dynamic range is the phase noise or noise sidebands on our spectrum analyzer local oscillator. An example application where we can see how both the noise sidebands and the Dano limits dynamic range is when making spur measurements. Looking at this slide, the dynamic range for the close in low level spurs is determined by the noise sidebands within approximately 100 kilohertz to one megahertz of the carrier. Beyond the noise side bands, the dynamic range is limited by Danel. Another example is when the signals are so close together that noise side bands limit dynamic range. For example, a two-tone measurement where the tones are separated by 10 kilohertz, thereby producing third-order distortion products 10 kilohertz from the test tones. For distortion tests, the phase noise can also be plotted on the dynamic range graph as a horizontal line at the level of the phase noise specification at a given offset. The dynamic range curves we just discussed are needed only for distortion tests. So we'll go over some spectrum analyzer measurement examples. So the BIRD uh, SH60S will do spectrum analysis. It'll do a adjacent channel power ratio measurement. It'll do channel power measurement. It'll do an occupied bandwidth measurement. It'll do NDB down from the, of the bandwidth. It'll do field strength and FM demodulation. And finally, you can build a spectrum mask. So the one thing, the spectrum analyzer, the SH60STC, it's a all touchscreen display. 
Menus are selected by swiping left or right towards the bottom. And as you swipe left or right, these other menus will come up. And, and you can do things. You can do a peak search. You can do uh, marker deltas, add markers. Um, and then where it says measure, uh, there this is where you would select several of the different measurements. So here I have an example. I have a sweep, it's at full span from uh, zero to six gigahertz. You can see that my resolution bandwidth is set at five megahertz. My preamp is turned off. And if I look at the noise floor, I'm at negative 60 dBm. There is right almost in the middle of the screen, there is a little signal that happened to pop up at Eventually, you know, it was there for just a brief second, then it went away. So we want to look at some signals that are below the noise floor. So the one thing we need to do is uh, drop that noise floor so we can bring the low-level signals out of the grass. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, let's turn our preamp to preamp 1. And as you can see, it does drop the noise floor down to about negative 70 dB. If I then go and turn on preamp level two, it drops the noise floor even more. And now you start to see some, some of those low level signals come up. Well, I can zoom in a little bit. So I add a couple of markers, marker one and two, and then you can see that I've changed my frequency range from uh, zero hertz up for, uh, to from from zero to six gigahertz. I, I narrowed it in a little bit. I've set it up for 1.7 gigahertz and I set my stop at 2.3. Um, and I've added a couple of markers, uh, kind of what I want to zoom in and look at. And as you can see the marker values, up in the right hand corner of the screen, my markers at 1.9 to 2.09 gigahertz. So that just gives me a little place I want to zoom in. So I do that. Now the next thing I do is I want to um, narrow my frequency range even more or zoom in a little bit. And, and I've zoomed in from to 1.9 gig to 2.1 gig. The next thing I've done is I've also dropped my resolution bandwidth from five megahertz down to 100 kilohertz. And you can see now my noise floor is down at around 110. So, you know, that's good. We're starting to zoom in and I'm, I'm getting a little bit more detail. The next thing I want to do is I want to move my markers in a little bit. So I, I put marker one at 1.95 gigahertz and Marker two is at about 1.97 gigahertz. And then, so then what I do is I, I center up my frequency. I've, I've kind of, if you look uh, on the start frequency, 1.952 gig and my stop at 1.989. I'm right on the outside edges of that signal. And the other thing that's helped me is I've dropped my resolution bandwidth to 10 kilohertz. So that dropped that noise a little bit more. So with a little bit of practice, you know, you can go out, you know, hook up your antenna, look for a signal, start with the wide frequency range. You, you know, if you need to turn the preamp on for those lower signals, you have two levels of preamp you can use, uh, drops that noise floor. And then, then additionally, use that resolution bandwidth setting to drop down. And then you can start zooming in, use the markers, and uh, you can find some signals. Another uh, feature of the Signal Hawk, it can have multiple windows configured with different setups. So if you tap on the plus sign up here in the top left corner, that'll add a second screen or another window. And you can, uh, takes you, when you tap on that plus sign, it takes you to the next window. And, and you can configure each window differently, depending on what your, uh, whatever it is you want to see. 
So you can have up to four of these tabbed window configurations and, and configure each of them individually. You can set them all to the same frequency range. You can have one set up for clear right where it's just constantly gonna sweep. You could have window two set up the same, except maybe you wanna put it to max hold. And, and what that's gonna do, it's wherever that sweep traces, it's gonna take the pixel to the highest level on the screen. You can have up to four of these windows, as I mentioned. You can select single sweep or continuous sweep, turn the preamps on to different levels in each window, whatever you prefer. Another one of the useful measurements that uh, you can select is adjacent channel power ratio. So with the what you would do is you'd select the channel power and the measure um, button down here in the lower left. And uh, then you can set up the uh, bandwidths. And right here, the reference bandwidth is 12 and a half kilohertz. So these are the individual channels that we're looking at. And you can see uh, the offset's 12 and a half kilohertz. I'm set up 144.95 megahertz and stopping at 145.05. The vertical blue lines mark the edges of the measured band. The next one we have is the channel power measurement. And this is also accessible from the measure menu. Just select channel power. And what this does, it shows the total power in the channel in dBm or watts and the spectral density in dBm per hertz or watts per hertz. The measured band will be marked with blue vertical lines. So if you look, we have channel power, neg 53.10 dBm, and my, my band is 20 megahertz wide. We have occupied bandwidth measurement. It's accessible from the measure menu. Again, select OBW. It shows the bandwidth of a user specified percentage of the displayed frequency span. In this case, we've got an occupied bandwidth of 15.17 megahertz, um, and that's covering 99%. And the measure, again, the measured bandwidth is marked with blue vertical lines. And then we have the NDB down measurement. NDB down automatically adds three markers. You select DB down here. Marker one tracks the center frequency and markers two and three track the NDB down. In the first slide, we're looking at uh, 10 DB down. The second slide, we're looking at 40 DB down. And then the field strength. When you do a field strength me measurement, there's an XLS file that you need to build uh, containing the frequency versus antenna gains. And you select the measure field strength from the measurement menu and add a marker on your desired signal. The field strength will be displayed. In this case, the center frequency is on 145.0 megahertz. The band field strength with 100 kilohertz span is 431.29 millivolts per meter. And the point field strength is 411.57 millivolts per meter. We also have an FMD mod. Um, so if you're out there and there's something you can't figure out what it is, you know you can uh, listen in to it. So select the measure FM from the measurements menu. The little speaker symbol on the left will select a volume control function so you can raise or lower the volume. Start recording button saves the audio in a WAV format. And then when you're stop done or stop, all you have to do is press the stop button on the right to end your recording. And a spectrum mask will tell you if your RF signal is outside a defined frequency and power range. You'll get a fail indication in the upper left corner of the display if any portion of the signal appears when outside of the mask. 
If everything is inside the mask, you would get a pass indication. And there's two methods for building a spectrum mask. The first one is you can build your own from the screen by entering the frequency and amplitude values. You can play around with it, and as you enter all these values, you can adjust them and get your mask just right. The other way is on your own laptop. Create a mask file in CSV format, um, save it, and then copy it to the signal hawk. And then when you there's a, a button there to load um, your free frequency mask from this display. And finally, tap on this little uh, arrow or diamond, whatever you want to call that in the middle, and you can alternate between the full screen or the half screen. So to recap, we discussed a lot. It was a lot of information crammed in a little bit of time. Uh, we never seem to have enough time, but uh, we did discuss a lot. We discussed what is a spectrum analyzer, uh, briefly went over some of the key terms and analyzer basics, and believe me, you can spend days doing this, uh, and went over some of the measurements to use. And uh, next week, um, I'll have another webinar. It will be uh, some training on triangulation with the AOA, angle of arrival spectrum analyzer. I'll go over what the angle of arrival is, what the applications of it is, how does it work, the equipment required to use it, and, and I'll step you through on how to do it.